is the problem, but what are some of the solutions that are being put in, in place. Let me introduce the speakers, and each speaker will speak about 10 minutes. We've designed that so that there will be ample time for questions, discussions, and dialogue with all of you. Uh, we do understand that some contact groups are only now finishing. People will be wandering in and out, but we thought we would get started now. Um, and let me introduce the speakers. Uh, Amanda Nixon will be the first speaker after me, who's the director of the Global Tuna Campaign of the Pew Environment Group. Um, the speaker after Amanda will be uh, Bruce Collette, who's the chair of the IUCN Species Survival Commission Tuna and Billfish Specialist Group. We'll talk about the role of IUCN in the recent uh, uh, new assessment under the Red List. After Bruce will be Toshio Katsuwaka, who will speak about Pacific Bluefin Tuna, and he is an associate professor at Mie University in Japan. And then our last speaker will be uh, Charleston Dai, who, with, who is currently chief executive officer of the Fisheries and Marine Resources Authority of the government of Nauru. And we'll talk about the role of coastal states, and particularly the role of this, the countries that are of the parties to the Nauru Agreement, and their role in effective management of, of tuna fisheries in their region. Um, also, at the end, we will have a panel for discussion and answering of any questions. And that panel will be joined by Ken Carpenter, who's manager of the IUCN Global Species uh, Assessment. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Amanda for background on tuna, tuna trade, management, and conservation. Types of catch methods. So, 
Um, how are these different species caught? Over here, you'll see this is person fishing, which is about 63% of the global tuna catch. Um, this is using these very large nets that you can see um, depicted here. Um, there's several different ways that uh, fish are sort of brought together or spotted. There's the use of what's called a fish aggregating device, which is an object, a floating object around which fish gather. Some of those are man-made, sometimes they occur naturally. Um, this is largely used for the skipjack species that you see in cans, also some yellowfin. One of the um, issues around use of purseine nets is that if you use them together with fish aggregating devices, you tend to get a very high catch of um, juvenile big eye in certain areas when you fish that way. The other way, the other main way that fish is caught is through a long line, which is, a, as the name suggests, is a very long line off a vessel with um, thousands of hooks. That is used largely for the larger tuna species, big eye, albacore, yellowfin, um, and generally for species that where you're looking to serve the sashimi and the tuna steak market. And that's, um, from recollection, somewhere between um, 14 and 20 percent. 14 percent, there we are. And then for pollen line, that's about 10 percent of the tuna catch. Um, and that, uh, you may have seen photos of that. You all can see a lot of um, fishermen on the end of a vessel, and they're putting, throwing in and pulling fish out one at a time, basically. There are um, particular challenges, challenges with all of these different types of management, but just to give you an overview of the different methods. So let's look a little bit more at the big picture. Globally, there's about 4.5 million metric tons of tuna caught annually by thousands of vessels. Many of them move from ocean to ocean um, through the course of a single year. Um, you can see the top 10 tuna catching nations there. And just because we are here in Korea, let's just note that Korea is uh, fourth globally with about 6.7% of the catch. Um, in terms of the five species we mentioned earlier, skipjack, the small tuna generally constitute about 60% of the global catch. Um, and you can see then that those uh, larger species um, are all forming various smaller proportions of that catch. Yellowfin at 24, big eye at 10, albacore at 5, and bluefin at 1%. One of the key uh, things to note here is that the skipjack um, species have the largest volume of catch, but the long line caught species are actually worth a lot more per fish. So there's an interplay of the economics there. The Pacific Ocean uh, yields 65% of the catch, which is a long way obviously ahead of any of the others, with the Indian Ocean at 21% and the Atlantic Ocean at 14%. How is all of this managed? Um, what you see on your screen now is the uh, group of intergovernmental organizations that manage um, how tuna is fished globally. There are five, you can see them there, and once again you can see that the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission is the largest, covers approximately 20% of the Earth's surface. Um, there are a group of countries that are generally key players in all of those uh, RFMOs, including um, the US, the European Union, um, Japan, uh, Taiwan, there are a range of nations that are generally involved in all some of the key challenges that exist in these organizations, and these are all issues that we can discuss later in a discussion time, I won't go into too much detail now, is in almost all cases, there's a lack of science-based catch limits. Um, in some cases, there are uh, what are considered within the RFMO to be a catch limit for that species, a limit, but in most cases, there is not an effective system of catch limits to ensure that the amount of fish being removed is actually sustainable and governed by best available science in terms of decision making. There is often a lack of compliance with conservation measures and real challenges associated with the cooperation necessary between the different countries involved in these treaties to drive decision making. In most cases, decision making is consensus based, which means it takes a long time and can lead to um, incremental gains rather than whole scale movement forward at a pace that we all might want. In most cases, there is a lack of effective gear regulation. One of the major areas that we're interested in, and I'll talk about this a little more in a minute, is uh, FAD management, the regulation and management of fish aggregating devices. There are also <coughs> particular challenges associated with long line fishing. Um, long lines uh, present a different set of challenges, but some of that includes very low levels of observer coverage um, on these vessels. 
some uh, fairly high levels of ecosystem impacts. There are some concerns associated with sharks um, when you start looking at how online fishing occurs and what happens on these vessels. And there's also, uh, broadly speaking, not been an ability amongst any of the tuna RFMOs to really develop an appropriate and effective regulatory system for long lines. Part of this is due to these issues. What's complex about managing tunas is they cross over high seas and exclusive economic zones. So you have an intermix of interests between coastal states and distant water fishing nations. You have interactions between the species and the gears. You may remember earlier I mentioned that juvenile big eye get caught in Cursing nets, fishing for skipjack. So actually creating an effective management regime requires taking all of those into account. Um, and you have the politics and economics of how different fleets are operating, who's purchasing access in which areas of the world. Let's just spend a moment talking about Korea, since we're here. Korea is a member of all five of the Tuna RFMOs. Um, it is what's called a distant water fishing nation, which means that it um, will often send its vessels a long way from its home shores and home waters to fish, um, either on the high seas or in the waters of other nations, if it is to make access agreements with those countries. It's the third highest consumer of uh, fresh tuna. It's the fourth largest catcher, as I mentioned earlier. Most of its catch comes from the Western and Central Pacific. And just to give you an idea what that means, there's about 207 tuna vessels, 173 of the long liners that I spoke about, and about 28 super sainers, which are very large first sain vessels. Um, I'll just highlight now, my colleague Toshio is gonna talk more about this um, in a little while, but one of the challenges, particularly since we're here in Korea, that I hope um, that we'll see some discussion about is that facing um, Korea when it comes to the management of Pacific bluefin. Um, there are particular challenges associated with uh, Korea's interest in that fishery and decision making. So I just want to highlight that for you now because that's something we're going to come back to further. To give you a little bit of an idea about what we're interested in, keeping in mind that my job here as the first presenter was to just give you a very high level overview of some of these issues. Um, and then the subsequent speakers are going to go into a little bit more detail on some of these. Um, we have a global tuna program recently commenced by the Pew Environment Group. and. The areas that we're interested in working on, and if you think back to the challenges that I raised earlier, are, is that we would like to see effective catch limits in place for all tuna species. And by that, we mean um, a system of regulating catch that is often called reference points, which means you have a system that says, this is about how much we intend to catch and we want to try and remain at that target. And then you have a series of what are called harvest control rules and limit reference points to help you actually ensure that if you move away from that target that there is a system in place to bring you back to actually maintaining your catch at a sustainable level. We want to see regulation of the gears, so we would like to see bad management plans that limit the number of bads um, and how they're used. And we'd also like to see vast improvements in long line regulation and management, including um, increases in observers um, on vessels to ensure that um, there are, we're not seeing misreporting of catch, lack of compliance with conservation measures, and particularly also to address shark impacts. Geographically, we're focused on bluefin in the Atlantic and in the Pacific, on uh, starting to focus more on Pacific bluefin and also have a significant focus on um, big eye and on skipjack. Um, and I want to particularly draw your attention since we're here at the World Congress, there is motion 36. Um, particularly uh, has language in it related to calling for the development of catch limits and reference points in tuna fishery and for bad regulation and management. So for those of you that uh, are interested in those issues or of course as a result of this event find these issues hugely compelling and want to come and support the discussion on this motion, please look for the contact group for motion 36. And with that, I will hand back to Sue. I think it's motion 38. Sorry, motion 38, I clearly can't read. Sorry, is, is this on? It saves me from running up there, now that I've spilled coke all over everything. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yes, it is motion 38. Uh, we're now going to turn it over to, to Bruce Collette. 
I just wanted to highlight that some of you came in after we started. We do have a sign-up sheet in the back, so we appreciate you signing up as well as uh, email us if you'd like any additional material. We have maps, information, memory sticks with documents, and a lot of other things in the back of the room that we would really rather you take than we, than we take back with us. So I will now turn it over to Bruce Cole Collette, again the chair of the IUCN um, Tuna and Billfish Specialist Group, who's going to speak about the uh, recent, recent assessment under the IUCN records. Sorry. Well, we conducted um, an assessment on the 61 species of tunas, mackerels, and billfishes using the red list criteria, which up to now had rarely or perhaps never been employed on uh, large commercial species. There are problems between fishery biologists and conservationists in interpreting risks to extinction the red list is designed to assign threat status to all the species we assess based on all the information we have. Of the 61 species, 18% lacked adequate data and were classified as data deficient. 64% were least concerned. And this includes the skipjack as the most abundant uh, can to them. 7% were near threatened, and 11% met the threshold for a threatened category, that is, critically endangered, endangered, or vulnerable. Five of the seven threatened species are tunas and billfishes, particularly the southern bluefin, Thunus mccoyi, the Atlantic bluefin, Thunus thinus, the big eye tuna, classed as vulnerable, uh, Thunus obesus, and also the blue marlin and the white marlin. Uh, all of these have relatively long generation times. And the problem here is that this means that it takes a long time for the species to recover from intensive fishing. Skipjack, uh, two reasons that the skipjack are uh, in reasonably good condition is they're a small species, so they mature rapidly, and they're widespread. They spawn over the entire tropical Indo-West Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, so that if a fishery depletes the population in one area, it's relatively quickly uh, reinforced from recruits from another area. What we found was that the species that have long generation lengths, that's more than five, sometimes up to 10 years, uh, are the species that happen to have the highest economic values. And uh, this creates a problem because this means that those species that are targeted because of their high economic value take a much longer time to recover from fishing pressure. And this is particularly true of, of the bluefin tunas. Now let me digress and look at an overall assessment of marine species. And what we have here are uh, a large number of marine clades, whole marine groups, that have been assessed by the Global Marine Species Assessment Program under my colleague Kent Carpenter. And what we see here is that the habitat forming groups, seagrasses, mangroves, and corals, have a relatively high rate of uh, species in threatened categories. Many of the coral reef fishes, angel fishes, butterfly fishes, parrot fishes, grasses, have a relatively low rate of threat status, even though they live in, in corals. And this is because they're not exploited. There's no major fishery for most of these. Groupers, on the other hand, are a little higher because some of those are commercially fished. Then we get over to tunas and billfishes, and we see a relatively high level, and this is due to exploitation. Um, sharks and rays have also very high, even though they're not usually targeted, but they're exploited by uh, as bycatch in, in shark fin fisheries. Now, 
this is a way of looking at the economic value, the generation length of a lot of the major species. And what stands out here is the southern bluefin, which has a very long uh, reproductive cycle. It has a very restricted spawning area between Australia and, and uh, Indonesia, and it has a very high value. So this species actually we rated as critically endangered. Uh, the spawning stock biomass is down to about 5% of the original spawning stock biomass. And this was done by fishing partly on the, the breeding stock uh, over a relatively short number of years. Pacific bluefin here we rated as green, which means that it's least concerned, but that was based on relatively inadequate uh, old stock assessments, and my colleague Toshio will uh, talk more about where that should be with more, with better data. Here's the big eye tuna, and uh, as Amanda said, this is partly vulnerable because the juveniles are taken uh, in purse seines around fads, around fishing aggregation devices. So those little big eye are actually a 